Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the final presentation today. Uh, as I mentioned briefly earlier, we are lucky to have uh, Vidar Furehov from Aker BP here to talk about some of their experience with uh, uh, scripting environments. So, um, Vidar, please go ahead and uh, start off. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Good. So I've titled this uh, presentation Examples of GNG Data Analysis Tasks in a Tailored Collaborative Scripting Environment. And I don't know if there's a price for the longest and most awkward title, but uh, there you go. A few words about myself, who's talking. Um, Vidar Fudolt's the name. My role now is Senior Advisor Digitalization at OKBP in our Exploration and Reservoir Development Department. I joined uh, the Norske in 2015, uh, and the Norske was one of the companies that later merged into Acker BP. Uh, my background is in numerical mathematics, and uh, I've been working in geophysics mostly, uh, pretty much since graduation with EMGS and Western GECO notably. And I live in Trondheim, Norway, for those who are interested. So um, this slide goes back a few years, I guess about two or three three years maybe now, when digitalization became a term to be talked about in Ocker BP and many other places, I'm sure. And we sat down and tried to define, okay, so what's new? Uh, digital, digitalization, yeah, we've been digital since 1960 pretty much in geoscience, so what's new this time? Uh, we sat down and tried to map out what what does success look like in the new sort of space of digitalization? Um, and for exploration, which I worked in at the time, uh, we set out seven sort of success criteria and founded them all on the term data liberation, which I think was mentioned by someone else as well earlier today. Uh, today, I will focus really on the one on the right with people exploiting the full potential of digitalization technology and driving continuous innovation. And in the lingo of um, digitalization, this has been dubbed citizen data scientists, um, which is uh, goes straight into the um, Python and how do we work with data context, what we're, which is what we're talking about today. So in Attacking this challenge, we started out uh, much the same as I think a lot of other speakers here today. Um, the users, we want them to get more involved with data hands-on using Jupyter um, and Python and getting directly in touch with the data. And then we realized that you need more than just you know getting people set up in Jupyter Hub. Uh, there are framework components around that that are needed in order to give a sufficiently streamlined user experience that regular geoscientists with little or no previous Python experience can actually uh, connect with this and start to use it. So uh, we have data here on the on the left hand side, the data liberation part. We have in Ocker BP a tight collaboration with a company called Cognite uh, and they their main product is called Cognite Data Fusion, which is a data fusion for uh, pretty much all data that Docker BP consumes that relates directly to our value chain, so both topside and and subsurface. But of course, in this context, mainly concerned with the subsurface part of it. Uh, we have the security and access bit, which is of course important. That is as watertight as is possible, and also that it uh, doesn't create unnecessary obstacles to the end user. Um, we can supply geoscience libraries that uh, um, that all users can have access to uh, and is a way of sharing code internally as well. Containers and microservices are useful architectural um, components that we try to use to uh, to package up code and make it easier to deploy and share and so on. And then of course, geoscience applications, two, two things there. One is tying existing geoscience applications into this environment. And the other thing is 
maybe um, actually creating new applications from some of the more scripting and interactive work we're doing in JupyterHub. So we can lay these components out as a sort of a pipeline, a pipeline for experimentation and innovation, as we've called it, with a number of components in there that I will show you uh, in demos now. And these, it turns out that these are chains in a pipeline, uh, which ends up in better analytics in the end, but that there are also a number of uh, value realizations to be had on the way from these components individually. So the way I'll structure this talk is um, to go through from left to right in this diagram and show you uh, with live examples how things work and how they're connected together. I don't think I've ever run a presentation with as many live demos as I'll try to do today. So there's plenty of opportunity for things to go horribly wrong. So fingers crossed and bear with me. So I'll start on the left. Uh, CDF is then short for Cognite Data Fusion. So I'll keep saying CDF many times today. Um, and CDF is essentially two things. It's a data store. You can think about it as a cloud data store. In the case of CDF, it happens to sit on Google Cloud. You could also equally well sit anywhere else. So this is where we actually store subsurface data, well data, seismic, geospatial, or any other data type you can think of that we would like to have sitting there. Um, it could also potentially sit in other, uh, you know, be just hosted on, on CDF and actually sit somewhere else, like in Petrel Studio or on a disk somewhere else. The point is that it sits in a way that CDF can say, I know where this data is and I can access it. And then there is the API or the SDK, which is essentially the front end to CDF. So the SDK can give you functionality such as list all the available surveys, get the volume of data, get a trace within that volume, or write something back to a new volume. And if you have a well-functioning SDK on top of a pretty comprehensive and uh, performant data store, then you've come a long way to uh, actually achieving this data liberation, because then pretty much anyone can connect if this SDK is, is open. Um, anyone can connect to it, whether you're an application developer or a Python scripture or anything else. All you need is, is access to the SDK. So I'll show you how this works um, quickly. So here I'm in uh, just in Anaconda on my local Laptop. My laptop, by the way, is a very standard ThinkPad. Um, just sitting here locally. <clears throat> so I import the Cognite Seismic SDK in this case, because I want to work with seismic data. And there is one line of code to connect to CDF. This is the command to do that. So now I'm connected to CDF. Underneath here, there is the passage of, an, um, of a key, an API key, which since I'm running locally, I have to set up in, uh, as an environment variable on my laptop. And the key, of course, has to be provided by Cognite. So that's a bit of setup that I need to do on, on my laptop to get started. Then I can uh, uh, select a seismic file. In this case, I don't want to browse. I just know that there is a seismic file I want to use. And I can have one line of uh, using the SDK, uh, get the binary header information from this file and print that. So that just gives me access to, to the header information. I can similarly use a command to get the line range, as in this case, a, uh, a JSON object, essentially. And then I can do uh, get me a, a subset of the data volume within this seismic, and I can give a specification here of the in this case of the inline range, I could also do a cross line range or I could give no range at all and get the entire volume out. And what this would give me back is just a pointer to a volume on CDF, but I append a dot to array here and then it actually downloads it locally to my computer and I get it back as a numpy array. So that takes a little bit of time because I'm constrained by bandwidth uh, from wherever this data sit on, sits on Google Cloud, probably in Belgium somewhere and down to my laptop. 
So once that's done, I just do some clipping to make it plot a little better, and then I just use uh, PyPlot to to plot the seismic data. So that's all it takes to fetch some seismic from CDF, and in this case, plot it. But of course, if I wanted to start analyzing it, I could also do that. So now this data is actually downloaded locally on my, in memory on my computer as a NumPy array. So that's all good, nice and simple. The thing I didn't show here, of course, is that in order to get this to work, I had to install Anaconda on my computer. I had to install this, uh, uh, this SDK, it's a pip install. I had to set up the access keys. I also had to download some additional, uh, very standard, but still uh, packages in Python. And getting that far, you know, would would probably lose 80 or 90 percent of uh, of my user community of geoscientists, at least in my department. So that's not good enough. So then we move on to. Let's go back to the presentation. To the next step here, where we try to enable citizen data scientists to actually get their hands on and use this themselves. So then we've produced together with Cognite a product called DS Hub, which is very similar to what um, Segal showed earlier. And that's uh, a hosted Jupyter Hub environment, which I can launch in my browser. It's, uh, it's similar to what uh, what was shown earlier, I just have a, a link here, DS Hub in my, in my Chrome browser. And what it does is it will give me a choice initially of the type of virtual machine I want to run. And I won't do that because it takes a minute or so to load. But uh, it's implemented now so that you have a choice of a small and a larger uh, virtual machine with a number of cores and, and memory and so on. So in this case, I'm running a small instance and it shows me how much memory I have available and how much I've used. So in here, I have the exact same notebook that I just showed uh, and I can run it again and it will perform exactly the same way and behave exactly the same way. The only difference, if you noticed, is that this two array command was much faster this time and that's because now the, the um, the notebook is also running in Google Cloud where the data sits. So the transfer rate for data is much faster in this case, but it does the same thing. What it didn't show is that in order to start running this notebook now, I hadn't, didn't, wouldn't have to do anything. I, if I were a new user, I would get uh, just a link to, um, to DS Hub. It's set up with uh, Azure AD for us, so single sign-on, so there is no signing in. And when I get in there the first time, it's all set up with all the uh, packages in Python that I typically would need. It's set up, of course, with the Cognite Seismic SDK. It's also pre-configured with API keys, so I don't need to give those. So all I do is I can go in the first time, I can just run this notebook, and boom, it works. Um, in here, we have a number of folders, which you will find the first time um, and one is a shared folder. So that's the same shared folder for all users. And so that's just a simple way to share notebooks. Uh, and anyone can create any mess they want actually in here with subfolders and, and stuff. So it requires a bit of uh, discipline, but at least it's there. There's also some folders like this one up here, which is actually uh, pulled automatically from Git. So if I change something in here, it will revert the next time I log in to the Git version. Um, and the only way to actually persist any changes in here is to commit code to the Git repository, which manages this code. Um, and then I have the possibility to create my own folders, like I would in any browser, just a new folder and start adding files. And those would actually persist until next time. So those are the folders I call my functions and notebooks and so on in here. So that's good. Then we've avoided or totally uh, bypassed all the setup to get started. And uh, and of course here we have started populating with the example notebooks, tutorials, um, and in the shared folders people can start sharing code so that if you're new to Python or new to using this, you can just open an example of connecting to CDF and plot some seismic data, for example, and off you go and you can start manipulating from there. All right, back to our diagram. Um, that's not the diagram. There's the diagram. 
So next thing I wanted to show you is a um, Python library that we've started creating that we call called Gale. Um, and what it does is it, it's just an, an internal Python library for doing some uh, common geoscience operations. So I'll go back to my Anaconda environment and this thing runs locally. Um, what I'll do with Skull Geo now is I'll first import it. And uh, within Skull Geo, there's uh, a viewer, a uh, seismic viewer based on, uh, uh, oh, what's it called? Forgot the name, uh, an open source library for uh, for visualization. Then I can create the viewer and it gives me a warning because I've done this before today. And then I can display a dashboard for uh, viewing some seismic. It takes a little bit to load. Uh, and this all runs locally now. I have a seismic volume that I've downloaded on my laptop, which is 47 gigabytes in this case. And what I can do is I can scroll through and I can uh, zoom and pan and things and you can see it's pretty performant on my as i said very standard thinkpad on a 46 gigabyte cube i can uh, view other dimensions as well y dimension and the z dimension uh, and the reason why this is so performant is because we've done some optimizations within the skald geo um, python library um, there is a prototype uh, seismic uh, storage format based on HDF5 and then we've used Dask and some other open source packages to optimize the rendering uh, to make it this performance. So that's the sort of thing we can do within Skull Geo but also of course much more computational stuff for uh, manipulating and editing data. Back to the diagram again. So these things were really for trying to enable citizen data scientists uh, the next is more is a sort of a higher level of abstraction again, trying to create modular workflows and reuse code more efficiently to scale uh, deployment and code uh, use as well. And maybe getting to the point where we can start to share best practices as code, not PowerPoints, actually write down the best way to do things in code and share that. And ultimately it can also be used to start automating some workflows. So one component here is called Cognite Functions. This is a Cognite product as the name reveals. I'll show you what that does. Then I'll go back to Jupyter Lab. And I won't actually run this and I'll show you why in a bit, but what it does is uh, it does uh, similar imports as before. I connect to uh, Cognite uh, Data Fusion. I select in this case uh, some well data and I just plot it as a pandas data frame, you know, top lines. And I can see that I have a number of uh, well logs in here and depths as I would expect. And then I define a function as a handle function. And this can do pretty much whatever you like it to do. Um, it has to have its own imports and it can take uh, a pointer to the CDF client and also a data object, and then it can do some editing. And what I will do in this case is just to try to clean up the data frame a little bit, because you can see it has these null values, I guess, from tech log, which uses minus 999.25, and I want to set those to nan instead. So yeah, just to show what it does. Um, and then I go down and deploy this function. And what it does is essentially it deploys it um, on Google Cloud again as a, um, as a Kubernetes container object. Um, and then it is deployed and I can view the status and after a while it turns to ready. So it means meaning it is deployed and ready to be run. And that takes a couple of minutes, so I won't do it now. But now I have a handle to this function and I can run it. So what I do is I call the function with my well data as data input, and then I measure how much time it takes to process uh, this for one um, uh, one well log, just a gamma ray in this case. 
it varies how much time it takes. It's a little bit because there are some things I don't control on the back end here. Sometimes it takes around three or four seconds. Now it took actually 18. I'll try it again. Usually it yeah, takes about three and a half seconds in this case, depending on how much uh, fun calculation is done, of course. I can look at the result and I can see that now my gamma ray values at the top have been uh, replaced uh, by NAN and I can plot the result as well. Looks good. Um, the nice thing about this is that now I can call many functions in parallel. So I can just call the same function um, over a for loop and not wait for them to finish. So I can do this now for all the columns in my data frame, just as an example. And again, measure the time and get a status for each. You can see that they start to complete in sequence. There's 12 functions or 12 jobs because there were 12 columns in my data frame. And it takes a little longer than running one, but it doesn't take 12 times as long. And uh, what it does underneath the hood is it fills up a virtual machine with as many function jobs as it can until the virtual machine is full and then it spins up another virtual machine. I think the limit is somewhere around eight. So in this case, it would actually have spun up two virtual machines for me and then feed the result back and, uh, and I could have plotted again, but I won't do that. So that's what functions can do. So it's a way of deploying um, functionality out to virtual machines on a, on a cloud engine and, uh, and you can use it, for example, to parallelize um, jobs that can be simply parallelized. You could also use it for seismic data, for example, to split up if you wanted to do, let's say, just an FFT over a big volume. You could just chunk it up with the traces and just send them on to different uh, function calls and run them all in parallel. And of course, these functions can also be, now once they're deployed, they can be used by anyone. So it's a way of, of quickly deploying and sharing functionality as well. Then we have a component called SWAP, Subsurface Workflow Architecture Platform, I think was the acronym. Um, this is something we've prototyped within RKBP and the Eureka X program that we have. Um, and I'll show what that looks like. So I have again a notebook, uh, just some helper functions and a lot of imports. And I select, I connect again to CDF to get some data. I select in this case two data sets because what I want to do in this case is run a, um, a service that can do seismic amplitude matching. I select some line ranges for the volumes and I can preview my input data. So this is nothing to do with swap. This is just, uh, oops, what happened there? That's never happened before. Okay, it was just a preview of the data anyway. So let's hope it doesn't cause problems later on. So now I'll try to deploy a swap microservice. Swap is a microservice uh, platform and I'll show you a little diagram. What it essentially does, it's, a, um, it's an workflow orchestration engine that lets you set up um, microservices and set them up in a workflow so that you can run them in sequence. And the microservices can be really anything. Uh, it's based around a, a Google PubSub um, event bus. So any service that, um, that subscribes to the swap um, PubSub uh, or event bus can listen for messages that come in, requests for jobs to rerun, and then they can, based on a protocol, say whether they can perform that service, and then the user can select them to be run, and, and it can be put into, the, the services can be put into a workflow and run by the user. And uh, so it takes some input data, goes into service number one, spits out some output data, sends it on to service number two and so on. And at the end of the workflow, the output result comes back to the user. 
in this case I will run amplitude matching which I've written myself uh, it's uh, it takes two data input seismic volumes one input data and one reference volume it runs a service that I've written spits out the output data and comes back to me what I need to do is I need to deploy the service and now it runs locally but once it's deployed it will um, listen to the uh, event bus for swap. And I can go back to my notebook and I can see that it's been deployed and there's a number of other services here that also listen to the uh, swap event bus. I can set up a workflow, give it a name. There is some parameters to this service uh, inline range and cross, cross line range I want to use. Um, I give the input data sets, so it needs an input data set that you want to shape the amplitude spectrum of and another one that you want that contains the amplitude spectrum you want to shape to. I set up the workflow itself with the data set and the parameters and I submit the workflow to run. I'm sure this was very quick and difficult to follow, but uh, you can ask questions <laughs> afterwards. And now what happens, it starts running. And in my command line on Anaconda, I can see that uh, it received an offer execution request, meaning my service received an, uh, a request to, for something to be run. And it said, yeah, I can run the service. And then it, yeah, so up here it received, um, can you run the service? It said, yes, I can run the service. And then it received a request to actually run. And then it started running. And now it completed. And you can see on the client side, I got messages that it's not started, it started, it's running, and it's completed, and it's done. And it gives me a result object back, which I can query for, for example, what's the location or ID in this case of the output volume. So it output, it read data from CDF, it can integrate with CDF. So it read data from CDF and it also created an output, new output volume on CDF. And it says, here's the ID key for this data set on, on CDF. Okay, good. So I go and fetch that and I can plot it along with the input data. So this was the input data, horrible color scale, but never mind. And this was the output data. So something happened to it. And just to make it a little easier to see what was going on, I plot the amplitude spectra of the input data set and the reference data set and the output. And you can see that the output nicely overlays the blue reference, which means it was shifted essentially from this curve down to this curve. So the amplitude matching worked in this case. Um, yeah, so that's swap. Um, let's see if I can find again my presentation. There we go. So that was very quickly the framework we've been working on. So I think I'll have time to, to recap a little bit. So we had the, the uh, data store at the back with an SDK on, as a front end to access data. I used DS Hub, which is a, um, a, a web-based uh, Jupyter Hub service running on uh, Google Cloud in this case, which is pre-set up with all the packages and the keys and everything I need for CDF and other common libraries. We have the Scald Geo Python library that we're developing in-house for common functionality that we want to use in the geoscience community, which is then also pre-installed on DS Hub. I had Cognite functions, which you can think about as, um, as a Kubernetes uh, uh, sort of, uh, yeah, a, a Kubernetes-based function framework for uh, for uh, geoscience work and then we had swap which is a microservice workflow orchestration system which is really 
able to run any type of service at lo as long as it um, subscribes to this event bus that Swap runs. We're, we're a little sure, unsure at this stage what how to continue developing Swap, to be honest. We're considering open sourcing it. So if anyone is interested in looking more at this, then please give me a shout after uh, at any time, essentially. Um, I think this uh, this can be interesting for other people as well. And what we were really trying to set out to do here was to create a totally neutral workflow orchestration engine where we can just mix and match services from anywhere uh, and mixing all old uh, software applications and new ones and things we wrote ourselves and anything else and fetching data from anywhere. It has no biases to any data platform and also not to any application stack. And on top of this, of course, we can build uh, standalone applications that use some or all of these components uh, further down the line. And that's what we're doing when we're developing MVPs and uh, new applications within the Eureka X framework. We are uh, planning a hackathon, geoscience hackathon internally uh, in about two weeks. We had a first geoscience hackathon in March and we'll have another one now. And one of the goals here is to expose everything I've shown you now to uh, a broader base of users. So we've invited people from, from our entire geoscience community within AkuBP to come in and spend uh, four days to solve uh, some geoscience task with, with this framework or not with this framework as they wish. We currently have about 40 participants, including some people from Cognite who will support. Um, and because of COVID, we'll of course have to sit uh, not all in the same place, but we think that can be managed. The last time it was a lot of fun and we came up with a lot of good ideas and also got to stress test the framework, which uh, was the foundation for a lot of the changes and improvements we've been working on for the past half year in getting to the point where I've, what I've shown you now. And then uh, hopefully this will also help get more users on board and get this deployed into the community and actually get value out of it. So with that, I think I'll end there. Big thanks for your attention and a few names here mentioned on people that have been particularly helpful in or important in, in establishing all the products you've seen. Peder Öschal, Nesben Rocknes and Ole Edvard Åke from AkerBP. A lot of people from Cognite, um, and then uh, two people from Baringa who've been uh, instrumental in setting up Swap in particular. So with that, I'll take questions if there are any. Thank you very much, uh, Vidar, for, um, for a very interesting presentation, and it's nice to see how far you come on these implementations. Uh, uh, are there any questions? Please, please come forward, and uh, and uh, we'll be uh, happy to uh, to to answer, of course. If not, as we mentioned, he's also available uh, and can be contacted if if there are any any particular uh, things you'd like to uh, to discuss with him. There's one here. Uh, uh, did, have you deployed any of the workflows yet to the general geoscience community, Vidar? Um, yeah, if you mean swap workflows, I'm not quite sure what is meant. Um, we have, so the workflows that we've set up are defined only in notebooks at the moment. And those can be shared and are shared on DS Hub. The microservices, um, I didn't actually say that. I deployed the one I showed you now just on my local laptop and it will die again as soon as I close down my Anaconda prompt. But we also have uh, set up a system to, um, to auto deploy from Git. So if I check in my service to a, a Git repository and set up a uh, or 
configure a um, setup pipeline for it. Uh, it can be deployed to be run on Google Cloud for as long as I want until it, it's taken down. Mm -hmm. So that's the way to deploy services. But services can basically run on any any backend, and you can mix and match. It's sort of transparent to the user where the services run. So the hope, of course, is that we will have a lot more services being written and deployed uh, with more users that come on board, and hopefully also we'll have some third parties that can uh, be interested in starting to write services for this. Uh, uh, you mentioned Google here. There's a question uh, if the workflows also works on AWS. Yes, they work anywhere. Mm. So the only thing is they have to subscribe to um, to this uh, through PubSub, through this uh, event queue that uh, Swap uses. Mm. Mm. But uh, as I showed now, this service that I ran, ran locally in my computer, it can run on any local... Uh, cluster or infrastructure you have in-house, or it can also be run on any cloud service. 